Welcome back to Preparing for the Unexpected. Today, we are talking with Shane Matthew about making good crisis management decisions. Shane, great uh, first and second segment. Now, the for the third segment, I'd like to start off, uh, is there a framework that we should follow or could follow? No, there, there certainly is many frameworks out there. When I mean, By framework, what I'm talking about is a structured and systematic way of handling crisis events. And they usually are represented by an acronym with each letter representing a step in the framework and kind of giving you guidance on how as a team to respond. And so I think that is a vital thing. We talked about team size and team makeup, but a framework so that no matter what the situation is that you can respond to it, that is vitally important. You might've heard of things like a uh, RACER, which stands for recognize, assess, communicate, execute, and review, uh, save, stabilize, assess, verify, execute, and learn. I mean, these are variations of similar tasks that you're doing. But ultimately, my point is everybody needs to be aware and we follow a formulaic framework every time. And then that's something that everyone, uh, I'm assuming, uh, is trained towards to learn. So when you're doing your exercises or your tests, you're uh, making sure that you can adhere to that framework, but at the same time, be adaptable if in case something else comes oh, Right. Up. The frameworks give you the opportunity to at least compartmentalize activity and everybody knows here's the four steps, right? Here's, here's the four steps to solving this crisis event. And in, in you, they might result in obviously different scenarios or different uh, outcomes. But the point is everybody has kind of the same game plan, right? Remember I told you about the point guard example. Yeah a game plan is necessary. And as long as everybody knows, here's the game plan, no matter what we do, even if everything starts to fall apart, you can jump back into the game plan. Yeah. And, and not, uh, you know, try to go through a 500 page binder, <laughs> <laughs> which I've seen as well. And I know you have too. <laughs> right. So how do we make decisions ourselves? What do we really need to consider when we need to make critical uh, decisions or even any decision. Right. Now, um, well, I think the first step is really a coming to agreement about how we're going to make choices. OK, uh, my wife and I, Sylvia, my wife, Sylvia and I have been married for 19 years uh, and we found that we are on the complete opposites of the Netflix dilemma. <laughs> she is a one, a hard one. I am a 10. Right. So what we learned quickly is that we needed to make a decision about how we would make family decisions, okay, and what that process looks like. So your team needs to evaluate the decision models and make a choice. Here's how we're going to do it. So you you have multiple models. And there's there's the consensus model where you got five people, a leader, and colleagues, and they're all equal, all right? So everybody gets an equal vote. That's one model. And then you have the democratic model where you have equal votes and everybody makes a vote and the majority wins. OK, uh, and then you have a model like the dictator dictatorial model where it's like, hey, I'm the manager. You know, I'm going to tell you what to do. Uh, and then you have the consultative model where you have the manager working with uh, the whole team, asking their opinion. But then ultimately they make the choice. The manager makes the choice. You have the group consultative model where everybody talks to everybody and as a group, you know, you you make a decision together, but ultimately the, you know, the the manager, you know, puts the seal of approval on it. You see things like um, airline cockpits are like that, surgeons in the medical environment are like that, law enforcement, military can sometimes be like that. Uh, so, so my point is, there's a variety of models and you have to first decide together before the event, hey, here's how we're going to make choices, right? I'm going to come to you as the leader and ask for your opinion, and then I'm going to make the choice, right? That's better for you to discuss that now than waiting for the disaster to, to make that, uh, you know, aware to people. Well, first of all, congratulations on 19 years. <laughs> Thank you. I don't hear a lot of those these days. <laughs> no, you don't. Uh, second is, how do you go about determining which model suits your organization best? Because it, looking at an organization, you may determine that the 
consensus model works best. Mm -hmm. But you've always got somebody who wants to take control of everything. So how, which is a different model. So how do you go about determining what's best for your organization because of all the different viewpoints that are out yeah. there? Well, I mean, I think number one, you have to have a conversation. And I don't think we as crisis managers have that conversation enough with both our, our, our leadership structure or the teams, right? So we tend to build um, training uh, exercises, right? Where people come together once a year and practice a solving a problem, but it never really addresses the specific core, core I'm discussing about decision-making. So having a conversation like we're having today, right? Hey, Alex, you and I, are, we're going to make decisions here in a crisis event. Uh, I tend to like to be um, a little bit more in charge <laughs> in having that discussion <laughs> with you beforehand, as opposed to not even having the conversation. I think that's really the key is just have have the conversation. And you as the point guard, you have to know your system. Otherwise, if there's no sense in being a point guard, if you're not uh, able to understand what system you're operating in. Well, now I know if I ever do any work with you, I know what to expect, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll have a conversation. Maybe you'll win. You'll never know. <laughs> so what about decision-making tools? Because uh, I read an article the other day uh, had to do with artificial intelligence, something else, else yeah. I know you've been uh, involved in recently. And it was alluding to the fact that some people are just using AI to make their decisions. But I know there must be other tools as well. And, and I don't think that every tool is going to be perfect. No, so absolutely. Thoughts I, on the different tools so out there? For me, there's two factors, the, the, the leading up to a decision and then the decision itself. So leading up to a decision, having a checklist oriented um, planning uh, tool is vitally important. It doesn't have to be electronic. It could be simple pen and paper kind of written out checklists of, hey, here's what we do in a disaster every time. It, it it serves as a memory aid. It serves as a way to standardize. It gives you a very, hey, beforehand, I can think through it logically. If this happened, we would always follow this framework using a checklist. And, and it's the, the Checklist Manifesto is a very influential book, in my opinion, mm -hmm. because it describes why that's so helpful to these really high stress environments. So again, taking out one factor, a major factor, stress, by having a pre-written list of instructions is going to be vital. So that's up to the point of decisions. And then when you make a decision in a disaster, why not have a list of decision solutions available to you in the first place? So I like a very objective-driven um, you know, statements, smart objectives, I call them, um, that that are listed out for different scenarios. Okay, so you have a predefined list of potential scenarios with objectives that you would want to accomplish. They're basically the decisions in advance made for you. So then you as a crisis management team, again, once removing some of the stress, can now look at this list of potential solutions to a scenario that you thought of in advance and you can choose from that list as opposed to looking at a blank blank screen and trying to choose from from uh, from scratch. Yeah, it's why I tell a lot of people, you know, when you've got a whole bunch of lists of things that you could potentially do and you're updating, don't hit a delete key because you never know when a situation is going to occur that that thing you deleted could have actually helped you. <laughs> yeah. you know, because, right. because different uh, um, uh, activities will require different responses. Or, right. And if, or even a combination of things need to occur. And if it's not there and you are stressed, you're going to miss out on these things. No, absolutely. So we only have four minutes left. Can you take three minutes and give us some final thoughts and ideas or maybe something we haven't covered yet? Yeah. Well, I think the, the takeaway here, Alex, is that we spent a lot of time on the planning uh, and training around or around scenarios, right? We don't spend a lot of time as crisis managers thinking about our team and setting the team up for success. Uh, and that involves really recognizing the fact that there are stressful situations that can impact decision making, 
that each individual makeup of your team has their own hangups about decision making on their own that they have to really recognize and address. And so therefore, building a effective team, a small dynamic team that is skilled and having you or a designated leader be the point guard and really becoming well versed in leading a team in a stressful situation is going to be vital. OK, um, one thing I will say that I, I haven't mentioned before and going back to the gamification uh, concept is that there is a um, game called Settlers of Catan. I'm not sure if you've ever played it before. I've, I've heard of it. You've heard of it. So this game is something I recommend. I know it sounds odd that you take one team meeting a year and you dedicate it to building the team to recognizing and understanding your decision models, but also playing this game, which has nothing to do with work, right? But it's it's a game where it's a strategy game. It uh, you Basically, you're building settlement cities and roads on an island, and it involves resource management and negotiation and decision-making skills. And ultimately, it's an opportunity for the team to play a game and make decisions that are not in a stress-filled, you know, work situation but my point is really taking the opportunity to set aside time to understanding your team the dynamics of your team decision making and then practicing decision making is really vital to improving your ability to respond to to a disaster and make good decisions then and when you're testing it's okay to make bad decisions as long as you're learning from them is how do we get here? How do we yeah. fall off the how do we fall off the wagon, so to speak? Right. <laughs> what, what did we have or didn't have in place that sent us in a in a completely different direction? Right. Absolutely. And because you'd rather do that <laughs> under control circumstances than fall off the wagon when you're actually in a real situation. Yes. Wholeheartedly yeah. agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> well at that, we have come to the end of the show. Shane, thanks so much for sharing some different perspectives and some interesting uh, examples uh, like the point guard. Um, I think people can relate to that. Sometimes we overthink things. So when we use an example that a lot of people can relate to, um, it, it makes things and concepts a lot easier to understand. So I really appreciate that. No, thank you, Alex. I appreciate the time to come on the show. I really enjoy talking with you and uh, sharing this information. I think it's vital for our industry. Yeah, and everybody, uh, actually, because the decisions that get made, we're all going to be impacted somehow. Right. right. With our organizations or if we're the public. So we're, we are all stakeholders one way or another in uh, decision making. So I really appreciate you sharing your time and your expertise. Thank you. And everyone watching and listening. Stay prepared, everybody. If you like that video, thumbs up. If you didn't like that video, thumbs down. But leave me a message and let me know your thoughts. Of course, don't forget to subscribe. And in the meantime, stay prepared, everybody.